Hey, 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 it's Steven, your host for the Black Doctors Podcast. The idea for this podcast was born from this campaign I launched back in February, hashtag Make Black History. I am continuously inspired by the excellence represented by my peers who have overcome so many incredible obstacles to reach the pinnacle of their success. This podcast forum will provide an avenue to organize these stories for others to listen to and to learn from. This podcast is our stories told by us. Hello. Dr. Bush, how are you? Good, how are you? Great. Thanks so much for uh, agreeing to join us. Absolutely. Glad to. So, first of all, let's talk about... What uh, what are you listening to these days for, for music? You know, I am trying to uh, broaden my horizons and listen to some new music, um, even though I am a huge Neil Cole fan. Um, I've really just loved recently the Jill Scott, Eric Badu um, live battle, but um, new music that I've listened to um, Janae Aiko's newer album, um, PJ Morton, not the newest, but the piano album. Um, I've really mm-hmm. been feeling his stuff. Um, and those are, those are probably the latest things that I've listened to. Awesome. I know I've been, uh, I usually use my Spotify, uh, weekly playlist and make something new every week. So I just kind of jump on and see what they've recorded for me or what they've, uh, compiled. Nice. So, uh, Dr. Bush, so tell me about your current job and your current roles associated with that, uh, that job. Okay, so currently I am a fellow in child and adolescent psychiatry at Boston Children's Hospital, and I'm actually one of the incoming chief fellows for the 2020 to 2021 academic year. Um, and as a fellow, um, we are working to provide psychiatric care for any of the patients uh, in Boston Children's Hospital. We have an outpatient clinic. We see patients on the medical floors, in the emergency room, and we have our own inpatient psychiatric unit at the hospital. So I do a variety of um, things within psychiatry. Um, So that's the work that I do now. And in my role as chief fellow, I will be liaisoning between my co-fellows and the administration for our department, um, helping with curriculum organization um, and development, um, and also just creating fun, good fellow culture. Yeah. So that's for the hospital now. Mm -hmm. And then I just um, launched my part-time private practice um, where I'll see adult patients virtually for psychotherapy and medication. That's amazing. And we'll definitely come back around to that a little later on. Uh, I know you're always very good at organizing good fun. We worked together back in Chicago during residency, and you were part of this House Staff Diversity Committee. Um, Can you speak a little bit about that, uh, what the role was there at University of Chicago and, and how that helped? Sure, absolutely. So at the U of C, I worked with Ashley Sua on the House Staff Diversity Committee. And actually, this work was handed down to us. It's That committee was basically designed to foster culture among house staff of color, underrepresented um, house staff um, for all different disciplines. Uh, Ashley and I would put together um, fun activities, uh, things in the community around art or music or eating, um, lots of hangouts, and also uh, things for professional development panels for medical students and fellows alike. Uh, We also together with you um, arranged some different financial talks and then celebrations. Um, I remember you were key in putting together our end of year celebration oh, yeah. for graduating residents and fellows. That was great. Doing that work really 
help to have someone to talk to outside of your program. Um, some of us did have other people of color in our program, but a lot of us didn't. And so it was nice to have that outlet to talk about what's going on, the long hours that we work, the patients that we see, and then also what it's like to practice to be learning medicine on the south side of Chicago um, with patients that look like us. So um, that, that was a great thing to be a part of. I miss it. Oh, no. um, we don't have anything like that <laughs> at our hospital now, um, but I, um, I still tell people about it who are going to University of Chicago for their training, like definitely plug into this organization. Yeah, that was definitely one of the highlights of my time at University of Chicago. Correct me if I'm wrong, you're at University of Colorado for medical school? Correct. And let's talk about what it all began. Um, when did uh, Bianca decide to pursue a career in medicine? Well, when I, gradu when I graduated from high school, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor. And so um, at University of Chicago as an undergrad, I took courses. I took pre-med courses, organic chemistry, chemistry, uh, physics, all of those, and they killed me. <laughs> Um, I was, I was crushed. Yep. Um, and my, my major was human development. So that was really a saving grace. I got to do study the social sciences, anthro, psych, bio, um, sociology. And so that was fun and interesting. Um, but the, the basic sciences were really challenging. So I knew I wanted to do that. Still did. Graduated. Um, my grades were not that great. And so I, worked for seven years between um, undergrad and medical oh, wow. school where I retook um, all of my science classes and I ended up retaking um, the MCAT as well and getting prepared to, to go to medical school. So it was something I wanted to do all along, mm -hmm. um, but it took me a little while to sort of to get prepared. And, um, but I did some really fun stuff along the way. Uh, my path was just a little bit different. Yeah. So what did you do during the, the seven years? What are some of the, the fun things or different things that you were able to get involved with? So for the first two years after I graduated, I moved back to um, where I grew up, which is Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I worked for the New Mexico Department of Public Health as a public health nutritionist for the WIC program, mm -hmm. which is a federal subsidy program for women, infants, and children. So I did that for two years, and then that led me into an opportunity with the Congressional Hunger Center, which is out of D.C., and that was an anti-hunger policy fellowship um, where I did some direct service and then also spent time in Washington um, working at the policy level to think about all of the things that impact hunger. And um, that, was, that was an awesome experience. And then I did that for a year, and then after that, um, through the Hunger Fellowship, I met a mentor that's actually here in Boston, where I am now, um, Deborah Frank, um, because the first part of the fellowship, you're placed somewhere in the country, and I was placed in Boston. Um, and so I met this mentor here. I was really inspired by her, um, asked if she might have a job when I finished this fellowship, and sure enough, she did. So I worked as a clinic coordinator for her for four and a half years while I took um, post-bac classes at the Harvard Extension mm -hmm. School and, um, you know, studied again to retake my MCAT. Wow. So definitely uh, an amazing path, and you crossed paths with some amazing people and did some cool things in those seven mm -hmm. years. But overall, that dedication to the field you've chosen just kind of shows uh, shows in, the, in your work ethic. So... At what point did you decide to um, pursue psychiatry? Uh, in in uh, medical school, during my psychiatry rotation, it was actually my first rotation, mm -hmm. and I came in um, believing that I would uh, be a pediatrician um, because I have been babysitting for a long time, taught kids church, worked in pediatrics before medical school, and I thought I would do developmental behavioral pediatrics, which is awesome. And then I learned about psychiatry and child psychiatry, which is very similar to, develop, to developmental and behavioral pediatrics. So um, I actually, the attending that I worked with on my psychiatry rotation was a black psychiatrist. Wow. And she really, and, you know, in Colorado, there weren't, there weren't many black <laughs> attendings altogether. So... Um, 
she was working at the state hospital, um, which is where I was, folks who were quite ill and also facing criminal charges. And she just really opened my eyes to all of the things that you can do in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And I was sold. I was like, this is so interesting. Um, You kind of, you get to see the whole person, you know, you can kind of be an anthropologist, you can kind of be a sociologist, and you also get to do medicine, too. Um, You get to do the, the biological aspect. So it just seemed like a great fit for me. I knew since I was 28 when I started medical school, I knew that I was going to want to do a field that would allow me to have a good work-life balance. Yeah. And so psychi- that was psychiatry. I loved a lot of other things that a lot of the other rotations I really enjoyed, but psychiatry seems like it could be really fulfilling, rewarding, and also allow me the space to enjoy non-work things. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've always said, and I'm sure you've heard this from other people, that you have the perfect voice for a psychiatrist because it's just so pleasant and soothing and oh. relaxing. Um, I know, oh, yeah, hey. just talking to you back in residency, um, I mean, you honestly helped me with uh, quite a few problems, whether you do it or not. I was I was cool. taking advantage of your uh, your services. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> Glad to do it. Glad to do it. So between um, medical school and college, I know we kind of touched on, on mm-hmm. this. You know, what was that biggest obstacle that you would say between getting into medical school? Mm. Yeah, I would say it's the the standardized test because I'm definitely a person who hustles and, you know, I definitely stick with things. So classes, courses, okay, you know, there are assignments to turn in and so you have a lot of things to balance your grade. Uh, and and a lot of things that contribute to your success. But the standardized test is just a one shot, right? It's a one go. And so that is an area where I really struggled and really had to put some energy and efforts and actually even um, did some cognitive behavioral therapy. I met with a therapist to work on test-taking anxiety for a little bit um, because I just, I had a lot of anxiety um, about taking tests and not doing well. So that was like a pretty big obstacle, but I, I figured out some things about my learning style. Um, I was really, really prepared when I ended up taking the MCAT for the last time. I had gotten a tutor, especially for physics, because I think that was an area where I needed just some extra help. Or was it? No, it was organic chemistry. Oh, I yeah. it back. It was organic chemistry. So, yeah, that was probably one of the biggest hurdles and obstacles. But everything else I could kind of overcome with just sticking with it and networking and asking for help from other people. Yeah, it's pretty incredible that in addition to that uh, determination, you had that self-realization that these are the areas you needed help with and you're able to seek out help to to improve in those areas so definitely i think Mm -hmm. something that our listeners can can take forward whatever Mm -hmm. stage they are at in the process of applying to medical school or applying to residency even the standardized tests as we as we know they don't really go anywhere absolutely they don't go away (laughs) no um yeah no definitely so um, along the same lines, you know, imposter syndrome, feelings of inadequacy, um, all those can kind of follow you throughout your career. I know I've dealt with it at different points in time. Um, have you experienced this? And if so, how did you work through that? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. I think that I definitely have dealt with it. I mean, the the interesting thing is that if you have good people in your court, they'll see you in ways that you don't see yourself. Mm -hmm. So for example, now I knew my record of uh, standardized test taking was not great. And um, my neurology or my neurosurgery rotation, having a great time, one of the attendings was like, oh, you would be a great neurosurgeon. You should definitely consider And I'm thinking, you have no idea what my grades are. <laughs> no way that I could apply and get into a neurosurgery residency. You've got to be kidding me. But what that showed me was that, like, other people don't see me the way that I see myself. Hmm. And so that's that can be really valuable. So having those people in your court can be helpful. And so it's really about supervision or having someone that will cheer for you. Another example I can think of is um, – 
my supervisor that I have now in psychiatry, we, we have to really think about how we develop relationships with patients and, and, and how to have good boundaries and things like that. And my supervisor would say, you know, this patient or this family is going to really, really enjoy working with you. And so like if I'm in the emergency room, I'm only going to see them for a short period of time. So I have to be very careful about how I develop a relationship yeah. with them because it's not going to be a longitudinal relationship. Right. And so I'm just like, yeah, whatever. I, there's not very much of that. I'm just starting child psychiatry. I don't even really know that much. And so how is, how is a family even really gonna trust me or things like that? And so, and sure enough, she was right. You know, it, it's been sometimes difficult to really set those boundaries and say, no, I'm not going to be able to see you in the outpatient setting. But the point is, she is able to see who I am, what's possible, and really help me to also see that and then to know what to do with it and how to use it in the right places. So I think having someone who can really see your gifts and talents and and help either coach you up or highlight them for you can really help you deal with imposter syndrome or feeling like maybe you're inadequate or not the right person or those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like uh, imposter syndrome is very introspective. Meanwhile, on the outside, you know, everybody looks extremely competent and put together, right. uh, but it's kind of looking on the inside, you feel like, like you're a, a failure. I mean, I def definitely felt that way back in residency and that's mm. why our group was such a special group to have because we supported each other in, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. When it comes to psychiatry, what advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue this career? Oh, um, I would say, well, you know, it depends on where you are. Um, I would say if you are an undergraduate, get as much experience as you can with as many different kinds of people as you can. So take classes in different disciplines outside of the basic sciences. If, you are, if your school or your campus has different cultural organizations, go to their events. Mm -hmm. Learn as much as you can about other people and other walks of life um, because that will come in handy. And that, that can be for any step of the way, medical school, um, undergraduate medical school, residency, um, whatever it may be. If you're in medical school, um, definitely uh, see if you can join a psych sign organization. Uh, those are on medical school campuses. If you don't have one, start one. And those are just interest groups for students who would like to apply to psychiatry residency. They may read books together or watch films or things like that. Um, and then get connected with your state psychiatric society. That's another way to get involved and medical school is not too early. So there are often medical school, medical student scholarships with the state societies. So I would say do that and then find a mentor when you're in medical school, someone that um, you can shadow, work with in clinic. If you are a researcher, getting into some research and getting your name on a publication if possible, but that's not necessary. Um, but if you can do that, it's great. So that's medical school. And then residency is a little bit different. It's kind of once you've made it into residency, the next step would potentially be a fellowship. And um, most of the fellowships from psychiatry are not super competitive. So you really can do what you would like to do from there. I think the biggest hurdle would be getting from medical school to a psychiatry residency. Okay. Let's talk about yeah. um, this hot topic, relationships and dating once you enter Ooh. into this, this pathway of, of medicine. You know, you signed your life away. You yeah. don't have time for a family. Tell us about relationships in medicine. Yeah. Gosh. You know, I can remember um, during our, our medical school orientation, one of the orientation guides asked people to raise their hands that were in relationships that were either married or dating. And he said that half of our relationships would not make it through medical school. Mm. And I thought that was just so awful to say. <laughs> um and just so harsh. And I, you know, definitely saw some relationships that 
really struggled through medicine, medical school in particular, um, did not make it, also saw the opposite. So I don't know that that has to be true, um, but, you know, medicine it really can be all-consuming. But um, it is not impossible, excuse me, to have relationships, to nurture them, and also take care of yourself. It really takes communication and, and dedication. And so, you know, um, not everyone is cut out to be the partner of someone in medicine. And it's a very unique thing. And so one thing that I saw in medical school that was helpful is that there was an organization for partners, whether they were husbands, wives, just partners in general, where they would get together and support each other because it can be pretty lonely um, to be partnered with someone who's in medicine. You know, we're, we're consumed in our work, right? And yeah, sometimes we, we don't have time to take a sip of water, mm-hmm. to use the bath. I mean, I can remember being in like a, an 11 hour liver case or something ridiculous when I was in medical school, but I was in it, you know? And so our partners who are not in medicine are not used to those kinds of demands. It, it's, it's unlike any other culture, except with a few exceptions. So I, I, I think that, you know, it's not impossible. And I think that everyone should find love and everyone should try to be in love because it's such a wonderful thing. And so I say I am very hopeful and I'm a romantic that you can certainly find love while you're in medicine, studying medicine. But one thing that will help you maintain a relationship um, that you started is to have good communication and, and also make sure that person is supported. Yeah. Absolutely. So there is hope out there. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And if there's not, I'm always a fan of starting it, right? <laughs> you can say to your partner, like, when they're like, oh, my gosh, you have to study again. Like, haven't you studied enough today? You know, you might try to network them with some other other partners and see if there's there are things that they would want to do to get together or things like that. So, yeah, there's definitely help. As we wrap up. What ways do you have for our listeners to get in contact with you? They want to ask follow-up questions or are interested Mm -hmm. in in following along your career? Yeah, you can can always email me at drbush at drbiancabush.com. You can follow me on Instagram at drbiancabush and Twitter. Dr. Bianca Bush. Um, but yeah, just email me. I'm happy to speak with anyone. Um, one thing that I would love to do for other people is just encourage them. I did encur- encounter some folks who were discouraging along my path. And I've said to myself that I will, I will never discourage anyone <laughs> as they're on their journey to medicine. So if you just need, uh, Hey, you got this, you got it stick with it. Um, I'm happy to, to be that person. Awesome. And then you do have your website, drbiancabush.com and the Bush is spelled B U S C H. Um, just so so you can find her online. And then with this new private practice here, you're starting up, would you go ahead and just, uh, give us a little more information on that? Sure. So I am seeing patients in Illinois and Massachusetts. Um, those are two states where I'm licensed. Um, folks who are 18 and up. I'm a psychiatrist, so I do both medication and psychotherapy. And so I'll be seeing patients for either of those issues, struggling with depression, anxiety, uh, identity issues, work stress, relationship stress, those kinds of things. Um, I will be seeing people one evening per week and eventually expanding uh, to full-time practice. But it's what I love to do. I'll also be seeing people virtually. Um, and that was a plan that was in place even before COVID-19. So while I'm here in Boston, I can see folks in the Chicago area, people in the Boston area, and you can be right at your very home because I'll be right at my very home. Incredible. Thank you for everything you're doing. Um, obviously, it does a lot for those of us suffering with mental health issues to have someone like you who looks like us, who knows our culture, and have you as a resource that we can um, receive treatment and therapy from. Oh, yeah. Glad to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. So until next time. Uh, thank you. Thank you.